All right. So we had uh, three breakout room inquiries on the table. One, what was the contemporary analysis of the text? Um, I'm sorry, uh, the song is called From London, Brianna. Um, the group is called SALT, S-A-U-L-T. Um, yeah, that's, I hope that, if you want, I can put it in the chat too. Um, so far as the breakout rooms, um, it's all good. So first question, uh, what was your contemporary analysis of the text? Uh, second question, in your opinion, what is the main impediment between positive uh, black and man, black women and men uh, relations, right? So what is preventing positive relations between black men and black women in your opinion? Um, and then three, what is the major distinctions between Afrocentric womanism and feminist womanism? Uh, who would like to share what was discussed in your breakout room? But sure. Go ahead. Yes, I want. I want to. I have said. I have said that the Afrocentric feminism mm -hmm. is is rooted in the spirituality and the, and the culture. Uh, we have seen that. Uh, God had created both man and human on his image. Both the, the, the deserve an equal dignity. And, and uh, the, that is the center of the Afro Centric feminism. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, uh, the what we can say the the the, the what the European Af uh, 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 feminism mm -hmm. is, is a matter of human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, uh, after the the, the 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 French Revolution, the, the the French Revolution, had many conse consequences. Mm -hmm. The liberation of the the, the slaves, the, the the liberation of 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 women, the the dignity for for the children. That that are men benefits from the French Revolution, and uh, when the the the, the, the Europeans uh, struggle for feminism, that they, they are inspired by the, 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 the values of the French Revolution. Very good call out, Bobby Pierre. So essentially what Bobby Pierre is pointing this to is that the French Revolution, it caused what I would call a social rupture, right? And because of the um, ideals and the motives of the French Revolution to give um, women actual power, right? Or, or to make them actual agents of their own experience, um, to end enslavement, um, to empower youth. These are some of the ideals of the French Revolution. And then these ideals begin to inform the way that um, at the time, right, white women look at their role in society and their in the way that they start to think about women's suffrage. So about Pierre is pointing us to the fact that this, this revolution that happens in, Fran in France kind of has ripples effects and it goes all the way to the Americas in the way that um, women seek to jockey for their place in the world. So this is a very, um, a, not only is it a, a great analysis, right? He does a great job of tying outside information to the way that he made sense of the reading. Um, so thank you for that, Baba Pierre. And then also he's mentioning, right, that, that Afrocentric womanism is rooted in spirituality, right? And I think that, that that's very important. Uh, who else would like to share? I think Joanna, you were gonna say something? Uh, yeah, I would like to share what we discussed in our group. 
And I would like to refer to the question, what is the, in your opinion, what is the main impediment between black women men relationships? And uh, we were talking about how it, that we analyze that it's um, not only in black women relationship, but it's, uh, I feel that it's a problem everywhere in all, in every culture, you know? And we were talking about um, the way we were raised and often we see that male, male dominance in our families, you know, in our culture. And it has a lot to do with um, education. And we notice the difference between, um, for example, families in uh, our countries and families here, they do tend to have, um, uh, they do tend to be better at, at some level, you know. Okay. Um, Joanna, just to kind of clarify the, the distinction. So you're saying some um, countries abroad, like where you come from. So yeah. And then um, juxtaposed to how it's done here, which way is done better, the, the countries or here? Oh, no, here. Okay. I feel that it's here because, uh, for example, when I visited my country, um, I live in the countryside, you know, right. and most of these families, uh, they're very poor. And the women, most of them, they don't work. So they don't, they're not financially independent. So they have very little choice, you know, to make a decision. As to here, you know, we, uh, we have that opportunity. Well, some of us have, have that opportunity to, uh, you know, provide for our families, uh, hold a stable job and um, obtain a degree to uh, a level. Mm -hmm. And um, we have that financially independence, you know, where if a guy is treating us uh, um, in another, like for example, if a guy is mistreating us, you know, we have that option to say, screw you, I'm out. <laughs> Whereas to over there, you know, we they don't, they don't really have that option. So we made that a comparison, so. Okay, Th thank you for that clarification because that, that, that makes a very, um, it makes yeah. more sense now. So thank you for okay. that. Um, let's get one more and then we'll move into my notes. Anybody discuss um, some, uh, some other object options, excuse me, as the impediments between uh, ma black male and female relations. I really don't like to use male and female. To me, it makes me think about animals, but um, the distinctions between um, black men and black women relations. Anybody talk about that in their group? Okay, uh, Claudia, what was discussed? Okay, go ahead, Gregor, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'll just say one thing I wanted to uh, point out with uh, in the book, it talks about like four connections uh, that called the the cast connection slash fourth and dependency connection mm -hmm. yeah those connections are very important and then another thing i thought i remember is it says here in the book that the negative the negative of your society are defined by and derived from three major structural and value systems uh, capitalism race, racism and sexism yep perfect Thank you for that. That's, that's spot on, Gabriel. You're pulling directly from the text, so I, I appreciate that. Um, Lorianne, did you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I wrote on page 273, it says, inherent in Bambara's concerns, the set of charges and challenges which have consistent, consistently informed Black women's discourse concerning men's approaches to male-female relationships and relations among the Major points of focus are the tendency to define roles which are unequal, exploitative, oppressive, and unresponsive to the demands of equality, reciprocity, and mutual benefit. Two, the tendency to subordinate gender issues to racial people issues and using calls to unity to suppress difference, critic, and challenge. Three, failing to define the terms and goals of the struggle to, so that freedom is a collective project, practice, and current relations prefigure the new society and community struggled for uh for resistance to redefining and reconstructing black masculinity and black femininity in and for the liberation struggle and then there's just a few more yeah yeah it, it's quite a bit right <laughs> uh, so thank yeah, you yeah i didn't want to read it all yeah. <laughs> um so I, what i'll do is we'll transition into my to my notes um, and and I, one of the things that first and foremost struck me was the serendipity 
of the reading, considering that we're in Women's History Month, right? And this is a women's a, a reading, excuse me, that's really focusing on, on women and women's needs, women's desires, and, and the way that women seek to um, liberate themselves from male oppression. Um, two, this idea, and, and it's not talked about explicitly in the um, reading, but there's this idea of intersectionality that Black womanism kind of brings to the discourse, right? And what intersectionality is, is being able to analyze systems of oppression from multiple vantage points or from multiple positionalities, right? So for one, for, for authors like um, Alice Walker, right? Her, intersection, her intersectionality is one, she's a woman, right? So she's oppressed because of her um, sex, right? And then also she's Black. So her intersection is racial oppression and gender oppression. So that's the, the ex access of her um, intersectionality, right? Um, if I can make it personal, um, I'm a male, right? So I'm on the dominant side of sex, but I'm Black, so that puts me on the lower side of race. Right. Um, I'm not wealthy. So that puts me on the lower side of economics. Right. So the, my internet, my intersectional oppression would be centered around my race and my economic status. Right. So this is how this idea or this notion of intersectionality works out. And one of the things and why it's important, the black feminist, sorry, the black womanist discourse becomes important is because it brings this concept of intersectionality to the fore. Right. And if you look at um, social phenomenon like the Black Power Movement, and you look at organizations like the Black Panther Party, one of the things that really become brilliant in the way that the women of the party begin to articulate, uh, I think I loaned it out, but anyway, um, is the women within the party are able to say that, you know what, yeah, we're fighting for a racial revolution, but the way that you're treating me within the party as a woman is fucked up, right? And I, I'm gonna be, I should be able to critique you and challenge you by the way that you're treating me as a woman, right? And so this is a, one of the things that black womanism is able to kind of bring into the conversation that wasn't really talked about prior to. Um, also, it's kind of weird. So at Cal State LA, right? Um, we covered Ida B. Wells. Where I don't know how many of y'all know who Ida B. Wells is, but for me, I, I would look at her as like, I don't know, like the W.E.B. Du Bois of Black womanism, right? She's like one of the foremost activists, intellectuals, and writers around advocating for not only the rights of women, but also for the rights of Black men, right? And she was one of the foremost thinkers around this idea of the anti-lynching movement. Also, um, she was one of the central figureheads of the NAACP. Um, but what happens is W.E.B. Du Bois, who's widely recognized as the father of the NAACP, removed Ida B. Wells from the um, from being the central member of the, of the board. Right. So even there, you see an example of a black man using his privilege as a male to further oppress Ida B. Wells, a black woman. Right. So this is in, in my history class at Cal State LA, but in my uh, manhood class at Cal State LA, we read an article. Um, fuck your gender norms, how um, Western colonization brought unwanted binaries and evil culture, right? And the central thesis to this argument is really, I believe, ar articulated in a lot of what Joanna was saying. And, and essentially what this article is arguing is that these um, gender roles that Joanna is being attentive to, not only in areas like Mexico, but also in the Americas, right? They stem from colonial intervention, right? So this particular article is gonna focus on Igbo culture, but I would argue if you were to look into ancient indigenous culture, groups like the Mayans, groups like the Aztecs, there's gonna be um, a different way that women and men interact and these stagnant gender roles that are being assigned in our modern world would not be reflected in those ancient times, right? So really what I'm arguing is the way that men and women in spaces of culture, right? In Asia, in Africa, in the indigenous parts of the world, right? Um, where they interacted was vastly different prior to Europeans coming in and saying, this is how women should be treated, right? So this whole idea of patriarchy, this whole idea of misogyny, um, these are really European male interventions, 
right? And if you are to use this article as an example, we're gonna we'll understand that this white European male intervention drastically impacted the way that these cultures would forever identify around terms of, of gender, right? I'll read you just a really quick, um, a really quick passage, just so you kind of get an, a sense of what um, I'm talking about in regards to how they created these gender norms, okay? So it says, um, I'll read the first two paragraphs. Go call your sister, pay attention. Go call your sister, tell him it's time to eat. My mommy carooned. I remember feeling so angry at the inherent contradiction in her statement. Some days we were she, her, and others, he, him. I felt frustration, frustration and anger because I knew that she knew that we were girls. I was her first daughter, the Ada of our family, which in Igbo is a big deal. Finally, I had enough. Mommy, why do you call me he sometimes? I asked with genuine curiosity and frustration. She chuckled with knowing as if, excuse me, as if there was something, sorry, there was some grown up secret I had yet to be let in on. You know, back home, we don't have he or she. Igbo pronouns are gender neutral. This he, she thing holds no meaning where we come from. Right. And, and it would go on to say that the ideas of he and she that was kind of created by European invasion and colonialization um, really stagnated Igbo relations between men and women. Right. Because the ability for a girl to be a he. Right. Or, or, or how she says, like this um, male daughter, if you will. Right. It allows that woman who to be able to for example, continue to keep the wealth of the family within the family, right? Um, for example, the person who, that he, she, the oldest daughter, when she's married, right? That name is hyphenated. So that way the, the lineage of that name that she comes from, it continues on, right? So a lot of the things that typical males you would think would do in evil culture prior to colonialization, women could fill that role and it was a fluent role to be filled. Right. So essentially what we can extract from this is that these ideas of gender perform gender roles, even if we're looking at Igbo culture, is an invention of European colonialism. Right. Um, whereas prior to European colonialism is it would just fill the need that was left. Right. So if you had no older men, then it's OK for the women to take that role. If there was no king to fill the throne, then the woman could sit on the throne and that was okay, right? So how they understood gender was a lot more fluid than the way that we understand gender now because of European colonization, right? So these are some of the outside context that I was engaging as I was reading through um, Karanga's text. Okay, so let me um, refer to my notes. So um, what I was really attentive to also is how these womenists, feminists, Afrocentric womenists, um, how they seek to relate with men, with menhood, with manhood, right, or, or, or men. Um, for me, I'm very attentive to this idea of relation, right, how we interact with one another. Um, again, relation is the root for relationship, right? So I'm really attentive to this concept of relation. And it says that, um, Women is feminist discourse cultivates a contemporary um, with male voice and vision necessary in the human pursuit of truth, good, and the truth and good in the world, right? So it's not about devaluing men's opinions, right? It's not about trying to take the place of men as power, but it's about working together to create a society in a world that recognizes both as equal actional agents, right? Um, they continue, although womenism has its origins in the 1980s, womenist discourse as a distinctive voice and vision has its origin in ancient Africa. Um, keep in mind uh, in this section, right, he's also, the, the Karanga that is being mentioned here is not Maulana Karanga, the male writer of the text, but his wife is the one that's doing the writing also. I don't know if you picked up on that, but a lot of what the Karanga is being quoted in this text is his wife, okay? Um, so Karanga, his wife, states that essential origins in African ethical and spiritual teachings 
and resolute practice which affirms the dignity, rights, equality, and indispensability of women in all things of importance in the world, right? So this is how Africa viewed women's role in the society, right? If anything that's of importance, women must be integral into that happening, right? This is how African people viewed um, the role of women, which um, Karanga is arguing is in direct alignment with the vision of womanism in the 1980s. Um, she moves on to work through um, the work of Maria Stewart, who produced the book, Mrs. Maria Stewart in 1835, which basic themes were womanism's reaffirmation of black people's identity as African people, right? And the obligation to honor the burden and glory of that history, both as men and women, right? So regardless of your sex, as you're an African person throughout the diaspora, you have to know that your root where you come from is African, right? And re regardless if you're a man or a woman or not, you need to honor that origin. You need to honor that root, which is Africa, right? Um, and then for me, um, I, I was looking at the work of Annie and Julia Cooper. Um, she wrote the text, A Voice from the South, which was published in 1892. Um, and, and to me, this is kind of dope because this for, for me aligns with the um, Ebo article, right? And it says, there is a feminine as well as a masculine side to truth, right? That these are resulted, I'm sorry, these are related, not as inferior or superior, not as better or as worse, but as complements, right? So that male and that female, that's a complementary force. Um, as I mentioned, I teach a African manhood course. And they say that one of the distinctions in the way that African people view manhood opposed to where, how Europeans view manhood, African people understand that there's a male, a, a masculine principle and a feminine principle in all individuals, right? So even me as a man, as masculine as I am, there's a feminine principle within me too. And that's not a contradiction, right? All individuals have that physical, that masculine and feminine principle, right? So even my wife, right? There's elements of a masculine principle within her. And this is, a, um, this is something that they find common in the understandings of African people as it relates to masculinity and femininity. Um, okay. And then also working through the works of Julia Cooper, she challenges black men to build a partnership of equals in love and struggle for liberation and higher levels of human life. So again, it's about forging these partnerships with both parties, with both sexes, in order to improve the status of society. Um, the 1980s takes a really uh, big kind of focal point within the, the reading. I, I would attribute that due to a lot of the, the um, readings that were produced during that time, right? Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye, um, The Color Purple. There's this 80s was a really, um, what I would call a rupture in the discourse where women are really starting to express their angst around the treatment of Black men, right? And it, and it plays out not only through the um, books that are produced, but some of the books that eventually turn into films, right? So um, the lot, a lot of the, the artists like Toni Morrison and these books that come out of the 80s, they not only continue to express the painful, intense conflict between Black men and women, but also revealed um, the development of Black women's literature as a major, perhaps primary way in which this conflict was detained, detained to be detailed and pursued, right? So this literature, this literary canon becomes one of the main focal points or the main apparatuses for African women to express their issues within the Black community around Black men and Black women relations. And then he gives us um, Afrocentric womenism, which is common themes as Baba Pierre notes, right? The rootedness in African culture, spirituality and ethical grounding. Um, self-determination, sisterhood, and partnership with men based on equality, um, juxtaposed to feminist womanism, which is critical of, but then also collaborative with white feminists, also bu often building alliances with them, but usually trying to maintain a measure of distinctiveness, right? So they don't mind um, collaborating with white feminists. Um, they, don't remind, they don't mind critiquing white feminists, but they still wanna keep a little bit of a distinction between them, okay? And then um, to close out, Dr. LaFrancis Rose Rogers. Um, and to me, this kind of gets to the heart of the deterrent between the positive uh, black male and women relations. Uh, I'll, I'll read, make sure I get it right. So she, she argues, right? What aggravates these external impositions is that 
Too often, many African Americans internalize the negative definitions of Black life. And to the extent that an individual has internalized these definitions, his or her mode of interactions with the opposite sex will be affected. Has anybody heard of the term double consciousness? So W.E.B. Du Bois in the book, Souls of Black Folks in the first chapter, I wanna say fourth page of the book, he produces this idea or this notion of the double consciousness. And how he articulates double consciousness is the realization of how the dominant world looks at you, right? Or how, the, how you're viewed from what we'll call the white world and then how you view yourself as a person of culture, right? So this is these um, two consciousness within one body, right? What he calls the two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged ruggedness alone keeps the body from being torn asunder, right? This is the words of the boys. So what um, Rogers Rose is talking about, in fact, is this double consciousness. And what she's arguing is what aggravates these external impositions, right? So what makes these external impositions worse, right? What makes the European notions of gender on Black experiences worse, right, is too often many Africans in America internalize, so they believe the stereotypes that have been placed on them by these outside forces, right? And um, then they begin to take these internalized stereotypes and play them out in their relationships with Black men and Black women, right? And how that may sound. Uh, I, I, I don't date Black women because they're too loud right? Um, they got attitudes all the time, right? So what you're hearing is a Black man who has adopted the stereotypes the white world has placed on the Black woman, right? And is articulating his inability to make a partner out of Black women because of the stereotypes. Not because of who she really is, right? But because of the stereotypes of how the outside world views Black women, right? On the flip side, Oh, you know, all men, all black men is dogs, all black men cheat, right? This type of conversation in the same regard is a conversation that is built and steeped in the stereotypes that the outside world has about black men, right? It may not be directly pertaining to the black man that she's dealing with, but she's internalizing these stereotypes and she's only viewing that individual through the premise or the lens of that outside world. Right, so this is how this dual consciousness comes into play in the way that black men and black women react with one another. And for me, that's the greatest impediment to positive relations between black men and black women is viewing each other from the eyes of our oppressor, right? Um, once we begin to remove the lenses of our oppressor, we can recognize that no, black women aren't attitudinal, right? That's not with this, that's, that's a stereotype, one, two, all the shit that black women deal with on a daily basis would cause them to have an attitude and that's okay, right? And, and to remove the lens of oppression in the way that I view black women will allow me to see that no, I should not criticize her for that, uh, for her, the way that she's dealing with these um, adverse circumstances, but stand with her as a partner, right? And these are the, this is the work that could be done once we remove the lens of colonization from the way that we look at look at and interact with one another, right? And, and the same could be said for how Black women view Black men. Once we remove those lenses, then you can begin to assess the real um, root of the problem, right? And instead of picking on the symptom of the problem, right? Does, does that make sense? Are y'all with me on that? Okay. So um, those are my notes. Let's transition into our fishbowl. <clears throat> Remember, you have two times per semester, two fishbowl. Uh, you have one time to pass. Uh, you could talk about your journal. You could talk about my notes. You could talk about what was discussed in the breakout room or anything that you found of interest. Does anybody want to volunteer to fishbowl? Uh, Joanna, thank you. And I believe this is for sure your second, Joanna. Um, anyone else want to volunteer? Okay, I'll call on you. Um, remember, you have one time to pass. Uh, Claudia, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yes, I, yes, I am. Okay, you okay? 
Claudia, you okay? Yeah. Okay. Sound like you was choking over there. Um, let's get one more. Uh, Kevin, are you prepared to fishbowl? Yeah, I can fishbowl. Okay, so we'll go with Joanna, Claudia, and Kevin. Uh, whoever wants to start it off, it's on you. I'll start off. Okay. Okay, so I feel that the main points of this section is the role of a Black woman, the importance of being a woman. And I particularly like uh, a quote that Martha, I think it was Martha Store, and she criticizes, um, she, she calls um, St. Paul. And if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, Paul from the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very familiar with his work <laughs> and the way he uh, writes about um, the household, you know, and he influences women to stay silent, you know, to obey your husband. And there's this uh, role that must be taken in the household, you know, and it's very male dominant. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, it's, um, uh, I feel that it, it takes a uh, male take advantage of this, you know, of these writings, you know, to undermine, you know, and to keep women in, in their mind in place, you know. Another um, good writer, and I, I read her book, uh, it was Toni Morrison, Beloved, mm -hmm. and I find it very, um, to be honest, at first, um, I think this is one of the first uh, books that I've read um, that, um, uh, she talks about uh, one of the particular characters, Baby Sucks, mm -hmm. and how af after um, that these people, you know, when they're escaping uh, slavery, they go to this place and she has like this spiritual, she takes them to the woods and, you know, they have this spiritual, I, I believe, I don't know if she called it a spiritual awakening, you know, where they have to learn to accept themselves, you know, and to, um, to love themselves. And I find that part very, it, it was very deep. For me, when I was reading that, it was very deep. And um, and that's all I have for today. And then so another thing, just kind of add to that, Joanna. Um, so that spiritual awakening that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about what I was saying around double consciousness, that is that playing out within the, that particular text, right? I, I'm yeah. trying to do away with how the master viewed me and how I've been taught to view yeah. myself from master and really see myself for who I am, right? That's yeah. the double consciousness that play. Good call. Yeah, and she and she, um, I remember in the book, you know, she made them analyze every part of their body, you know, like their skin, their hair, everything. It was, it, it was something very deep, very deep. And, and, and I, I didn't know, I didn't mean to go too deep into this, but you, you're right on point. But if you think about how oppression works for the formerly enslaved, right? Um, I, don't, I don't, you may not even know this, but women weren't able to show their natural hair, right? So that's why when you see a lot of the enslaved women, their, their hair is covered, right? Yeah. So you're you're being instructed and you're being socialized to have an adverse response to the way that your hair grows, right? Um, the skin, right? You, you become other because of your skin. So for me, um, what's really brilliant about that scene that you're being attentive to is what Morrison is writing is a healing process. Yeah. Right? Like he, because yeah. I, I've been damaged and I've been... Um, altered the way that I caught trauma right has been caused in the way that I relate to my hair and the way that I relate to my skin and the shape of my body right mm -hmm. and, and to heal that trauma I need to familiarize myself and be comfortable with these things that I've been socialized to have an adverse response to so I, I think that's a great analysis and a great outside um, resource to pull to help you make sense of what's going on yeah. with the text yeah who's next I can go next. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so just going on earlier about one, one of the questions of how um, contemporary analysis, kind of like what Joanna said already, how this chapter is main, mostly focusing on women and their contributions and how they've played a role in history and um, shaping uh, how society is today and how they do. There's, there's even, there's like, um, how do I say this? There's different aspects to it, which goes to the third question of um, the distinction between Afrocentric womanism and feminist womanism. Afrocentric womanism tends to lean more towards, well, obviously, of course, more towards Black women, but more for them on them trying to reaffirm or reassert their um, African culture, spiritual, spiritual and ethical grounding, 
while feminist womanism, it's more of a, it's all women allied together, working towards common goals. And it's not just specifically um, goals that like sp help out women specifically. It's also, uh, it's, it's essentially just human rights altogether that they're fight working for. Um, I'm gonna let Claudia go. I'm gonna kind of complicate your, your statement a little bit though, Kevin, okay? Um, Claudia? Um, yes, it was a point that you made of um, when you said uh, the stereotypes of a uh, woman have, black women have attitude and um, that they might have to go through a lot of extra things to justify it. Mm -hmm. um, I was, we were talking about in our breakout group about how it's still very unfair on women in general versus men and how it's even harder for African-American women to break into certain roles because women are expected to raise families and be caretakers, whereas men just have that freedom to work on their careers. Um, I just thought you made a really good point of all the hardships that Black women, especially compared to Black men, might face and why the stereotype might not be true, but why it's just applied in general. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Uh, and then I think, too, for me, I, I'm especially attentive to that because uh, I believe it, Ahmed Sekou Toure, who was the president of Guinea, um, he says that African women have the potential of being the slave of a slave. Right. So essentially what he's arguing is that even in the enslaved state of African people, right, even on the plantation, because of the male dominated society, the enslaved African men can extend his oppression to his mate, right, to his wife, to his sister, to whatever the case may be, because of the aspects of male domination. And, and when I kind of wrap my mind around that, it really caused me to look at my actions, look at the way that I'm interacting with women and making sure that I'm not, in fact, making my significant others, my partners, my mother, whoever the case may be, with some, I may say, Ture calls the slave of the slave, right? So, um, yeah, it, it's really that intersectionality becomes really important and it allows you to kind of especially as a man, right? Especially as a man, it causes you to really be reflexive in the way that you look at your relations to women. Um, one of the things that, give me one second, let me close the door. Okay, one of the things I, I want to kind of expand or push, I don't say push back, but kind of investigate a little bit deeper um, was Kevin's claim that um, the women's movement or the feminist movement is a little bit more universal, um, is looking to argue and advocate for human rights, whereas the Afrocentric movement is, is, is more specified in the rights of who they're looking to advocate for. Um, I would challenge that by saying that's not the case, in fact, with the feminist movement. And because of it not being the case, right, the Black womanist movement had to be developed. And, and I used, um, I mentioned earlier, Ida B. Wells, right? Not only did she advocate for the anti-lynching um, to help African men who were disproportionately being lynched, right? She was also a central figure in the women's suffrage movement. Um, she helped organize a women's march to Washington, um, one of the major women's marches to Washington. And um, when it came for the march, to march down, I believe it's Philadelphia Street in, in, in the state in the capital. Um, the other organizer told her or requested that her her delegates, which were black, move to the back of the march, right? And they were trying to segregate the march. So I bring this up as an example to say that this notion of um, feminist movement being universal is, is far from the fact, right? Um, same thing could be said for Harriet Tubman, who tried to do some women's suffrage work, but her race did not allow her to be able to fully engage in that movement. Um, does anybody remember, uh, I wanna say 2020 or 2019 in the summer, there was another women's march and they had like the pink hats and, and they were all marching with these pink hats um, and they were marching against Trump's election, right? Uh, and this is what I found interesting about that. By and large, that women's march was made up by white women, right? Statistically, statistically by the stats, for Trump to be elected into the office, at least half of white women had to vote for Trump, 
right? Just by the by the numbers, he would not have been able to be placed into office if not for the the vote of at least fifty percent of the white women demographic, right? So to me, there's something contradictory here that you're having all these women turn out for this women's march to get him out of office when at least half of y'all here had to vote to get him in the office. You, you see where I'm going with this, right? So another way to think about this or another way to articulate this, at the time, at the polls, right, at the time of election, they voted with their race in mind, right? So I'm gonna put this man into office because he speaks to my racial identity, right? And they left all of his sexism and all that at the window, because even in his campaign trails, he told you very well who he was, right? So I grab him by the pussy. This is his words, right? So you cannot assume that he was not a sexist going into office, right? But you chose to let that aside to honor your whiteness. And now that he's in office and things aren't going a way that you thought they may go, you want to march and rally off the position of your sex, right? There's a contradiction at play. And that's a contradiction that can only be played out within the feminist movement, right? Because again, if we think about intersectionality, women of culture don't have the luxury to say, well, I'm gonna vote with my racial identity first, right? Because they know that I'm, I'm oppressed because of race and I'm also oppressed because of sex, right? So I say all this that we gotta be very careful about ascribing things like um, human rights to movements like um, the feminist movement, which historically and still to this day, leave out other women from that conversation and from that discourse, okay? Does, does that make sense? Y'all see where I'm going with that and why I, I had to kind of take some time to iron that out? Because it's talked about within the text, but it's not explicitly laid out. So I wanna make sure you have a very clear understanding of that. Um, all right, so thank you all for the fishbowl. Everyone has some really, really good comments and insight. Um, let's open it up to a broader conversation. What are some other thoughts about the reading? Excuse me. Um, I think that um, at the end, it provides a solution. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we were talking in, the, in our fishbowl, you know, in order to create change, we have to be the change in our in this world, you know, in our communities, you know, and we were talking with um about how we, you know, as um I as a woman, I'm trying to do something different with um I have kids, so I'm trying to portray this idea, you know, to make not the way that I was not the way that I was raised, you know, not that is that I was raised in a bad way, but I'm trying to create a difference, you know, and I do have a son, so. I always tell him, you know what, you have to be respectful, you know, and I'm trying to create not that what we call as Latinos that machista in them, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, to treat others with respect and by others, I mean, everyone yeah. and particularly women. Yeah. Yeah. Especially women. Um, yes. do, do you have a daughter too, or just a son? I have a daughter. I have uh, two daughters and a son. Yeah. So that, that's dope because like, a lot, you get to kind of play that out with their relationship, right? And, and same for me, I have a, um, a daughter and, and a son. Um, and then it's interesting though, because my daughter is the oldest, right? So she's very much like, it's, she's the older sibling and she takes full advantage of that, right? So um, it's having to express to him to honor her as a woman, but then stand up for yourself as the youngest, right? So it's kind of like a, a little dance that he has to do. Um, yeah. but, but you're, it's, a, it's a great call out and I like how you articulate, because oftentimes, right? We have these conversations with women. Oh, you have to empower yourself. You got you. You know, you're just as valuable. Woof -woo, which is important. I'm not diminishing mm -hmm. that. But we need to also be having those conversations with men because yeah. you know it can't just go one way. It's not going to change yeah. if you're only talking to women. So that, that's very good. Thank you. Yeah. Other thoughts? Uh, this isn't a thought that I have. It's just that uh, recently Pierre put a question in the. In the, in the chat so i don't know just want to point that out yeah thank you kevin um i, I read it and I, I forgot so critical thing he said femicide generally takes place in environments when men are in the in throne i think throes of material and psychological difficulties and black families plagued by slavery and racial segregation one will expect femicide to be a common occurrence why was it not so um well one think think about think about this Baba pierre in the um, plantation society, right, one of the most valuable things was the production of new enslaved people, 
right? So one of the biggest things that a woman could do was have a baby, right? Because that's producing more of a enslaved population. So I think one of that, that's one of the um, major reasons why you didn't see that in, in that particular um, situation. Um, segregation, that, that, that's a little more complicated because at that point, you know, well, one way to look at that, um, you can look at the work, I believe her name is Margaret Mead. I could be, no, it's not Margaret Mead. I'm, I'm strictly wrong about that. I'm sorry. Um, the lady behind Planned Parenthood, right? One could argue that that is a institution that was set in place to kind of limit the black population. That's an argument that's out there, right? And I believe that that kind of came into fore around the same time of, of segregation and Jim Crow and things of that nature. Um, does that kind of speak to your question, Baba Pierre? Uh, today is the 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 international uh, women's day, and uh, is that day inspired inspired to me my my critical thinking question because. Uh, the the phenomenon of femicide is uh, a phenomenon which we 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 can see throughout the 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 world, and uh, I I used to to base my analysis on comparatism mm -hmm. and uh, some issues are common and uh, all uh, families around the world mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and uh, f f f violence the, the violence violence Mm -hmm. against the 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 the, the women mm -hmm. the women are common through the world why uh, karenga did not analyze violence among the, the enslaved and, and uh, 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 among the the black slav families yeah um i see what you're saying okay um yeah that, that's, that's a good question he doesn't go into that too much um within this reading and, and it may be more so because he wants to kind of show um women from an empowered vantage point right opposed to them being subjective to brutality and violence um when I was listening to you, I was even thinking about something more contemporary, more recent, um, as it compares to like the, the institution of enslavement, right? I was thinking about the 60s and I was thinking about um, the works of those like, uh, what's his name? Shit. The book is called Soul on I, Eldridge Cleaver, Eldridge Cleaver, where he, he kind of advocates for violence against women as a liberatory force, right? Really, really um, demented type of um, frame of thought. Um, but yeah, I, I agree, man. Um, and, and I think when you look at violence uh, women in the plantation society, you know, rape was a very strong part of that culture, right? Um, you know, a lot of that mulatto, those mulatto babies stem from rape, right? And I would argue even um, if you want to say it's consensual, right? I don't believe there can be any type of consent in that environment, right? I don't believe there's no form of consent between the owner and the runner of the plantation and those who are um, workers of the plantation, right? Because of the, the pervasiveness of the power, there's no such thing as consent. So even when you're thinking you're consenting, you're still, in my argumentation, you're still being raped, right? So I, I think um, from that standpoint, um, femicide was, was proliferated all throughout the plantation, but it wasn't, they would kind of try to stop at the level of killing them because they needed that reproduction force, reproductive force. Mm -hmm. um, a great, a great, great, great 
um, book that deals with what uh, Baba Pierre is talking about is, is titled Scenes of Subjection um, by Cydia Hartman. And what she talks about is how um, power causes these scenes, right? Um, where people are being subjected and, and this, this notion of subjectivity, um, she even breaks it down to someone's voice being subjected because of their voice being um, a byproduct of the violence that's being ensued on them. And one of the first things that is being investigated is um, Frederick Douglass in his autobiography talks about the first time that he realized that he was an enslaved person was the beating of his aunt, aunt Hester. Right. And what really gave him that realization that he was an enslaved person was the screams that Unhester um, yells during her beating. Right. And um, that scene, right, that scene of subjection um, is what Hartman's going to analyze. And she's going to look into how power plays out to allow people to produce these scenes of subjection or these grotesque scenes of pleasure. Right. And oftentimes there's a very thin line between those who are doing the subjection, viewing this as pleasure or viewing it as pain. That's another thing that that Hartman kind of brings to the fore um, within that 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 um, conversation within the text. Um, let's get two more conversations about uh, the reading and then we'll call it a day. Or two more comments, excuse me. Uh, Brianna, what were your thoughts on the reading or the conversation or the notes? Um, I liked it a lot. I mean, um, just like I was in Joanna's group, so it just, you know, it, you could see the similarities of like what we were, um, sorry, what we were, um, Like how true, like because of stereotypes and this and that, like we um how should I say this? Um it just makes it harder for people to like be understood and be um like sorry, I saw someone in the chat. Um Sorry, I like lost my train of thought right now. You're saying <laughs> um, because of stereotypes, it makes it harder. And then you kind of pause there. Um, is it, it makes it harder for us to relate to one another? Right? Where do you think you're going? No, no, no. no. Like it, like, um, sorry. What I meant to say was um, like, you could see those similarities um, like of, uh, like, for example, that cash, um, what's it called? The cash connection. Like, I feel like if it's true for every woman, like, you know, we are told to like, yeah, you have like, make sure that he has like good, um, he is from a good wealthy money or like family and like things like that. Like I, like, even though it's sad that that's, that it is like that we are told hold that and it's like why like why are we just listening to others and not like finding out for ourselves or like you know let us be independent like how we you know we should be independent like we shouldn't be relying on anyone else yeah and um yeah and it's sad that it like it has to be that way yeah yeah, yeah. I, I agree um a uh, unique you want to kind of mention what you're putting in the chat Sorry, um, I was chasing my dog. I was just saying, um, I found on page 282, I found this to be important. It says, it is important to repeat that any solution that evolves must be a collective and community affirming solution. One that honors the moral demands of equality, mutual respect and reciprocity. 
for me, like I just strongly believe in like uplifting, mm -hmm. upliftment, because at the end of the day, if we are to progress in life, we must also like understand the past, but not harp on it. Because if we harp on our past, we can't move forward and we keep, um, we keep this chaos of confusion going on. But if we speak out and uh, uplift one another and hold ourselves accountable while we're uplifting others, then at the end of the day, we can progress and uplift one another. Because at the end of the day, like for me, growing up, I was not uplifted. <laughs> I was always um, like pushed down. So for me, it's like encouragement and understanding that we all come from some place and we all have a story to tell, we should not, um, we should not hinder anyone from sharing their story because each in, each of us have a story to tell, especially if we are of those who are of, of oppression, which is a lot of us. So um, I just find like uplifting community is a strong point. Like I always try to do that with my kids. Like they're young men right now about to turn, be adult soon in a couple of years. And at the end of the day, I want them to enter the, the real world knowing who they are so that they're not in searching. They're not in search as an adult of who they are. They already know who they are and they can enter the real world and say, you know what, this is me. Either you like me or you're not, but this is me. And you can't, you can't tell me who I'm supposed to be. I know who I'm supposed to be type thing, but we all can grow. Like it's always a growing, evolving situation. But at the end of the day, it's like, I'm going to evolve in a way where I'm not suppressing myself. Yeah. And, and I, I think unique to your point, right? Once you get to that place where you're not suppressing yourself, you'll be in a place where you don't feel comfortable suppressing others. And, and I think that's oftentimes the disconnect is like, you only, you can only do to others what you allow for yourself, if that makes sense. Um, and and I, I agree with you. Um, we got it. We got to move together. You know, you're going to move a lot further together than you are apart. And and at the end of the day, as a man, right, we have hella work to do as men in society. Like, there's a lot. There's vast, vast work to be done within our community. And it would be um, foolish and negligent, right, for me as a man to expect the work to come from women to course correct male behavior. That's just as foolish as saying that I expect um, us as Black folks to do the work to course correct the ill actions of those who occupy white bodies. It's just, it, just as much as that would not make sense, it would not make sense for me as a man to expect a woman to do the work, right? So the work and the responsibility and the ownership, it, it falls on us as men to, to get this right. And I, I was talking to my wife last night and I was saying, like, really, I genuinely believe in my soul, right? It should be like a, a century, at least a hundred year period where there's no men in, in positions of power. It should just strictly, things should be ran by women for a good century, for a good hundred years, just to kind of create some kind of balance within the way that things have been gone on because we had our chance as men to rule and we see what we got. And I'm not comfortable with this status quo and the way that things are. So maybe it may be time for us to sit the fuck down and let women kind of course correct a lot of the things that we messed up. So um, Baba Pierre, is it okay to end class here, sir? Please, can you repeat? Yes, uh, is it okay that we end class today, right now? Yes. Okay. I'm okay, I'm okay. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you, Baba Pierre. Um, so I know y'all on spring break next week. Um, enjoy. Um, try to ha have some fun. Try to, you know, stay safe, though. Um, and then we will come back and prep for our midterms, and we'll go from there. All right, y'all. Be healthy, be wealthy, be wise. Peace. Hey, thank you, Professor. All right, have a good one, Gabriel.